they all have the program, right? You have you have the program? Okay, thank you, Bobby. Uh, good to see all of you. <laughs> Some familiar faces. Uh, as Bobby said, so today we're trying to be very ambitious. We're trying to cover three suttas in one day. I think that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> Uh, so when we do that, we will not be able to go in depth, right? But then, you can you hear? Can you hear the back? <coughs> so I'm saying that we try to cover three suttas in, in one session, on one day, then we will not be able to go into the details, right? Because there's a lot that we can learn uh, from each of the suttas. But the, the advantage is then you have, <laughs> you're exposed to uh, most suttas, there are thousands of suttas. Uh, I don't know whether in one lifetime you can actually finish all of them. All right. So to, today we're going to look at three suttas. Uh, two of them are actually from the middle length sayings. Right? There are actually 152 suttas in the middle length sayings. So we're just going to look at two of them. And the third one is actually from the uh, the gradual sayings, right? The Anguttara Nikaya. Now, <coughs> well, they. Bobby asked me to speak on something on, on reflection, wise reflections, right? And then pick some suttas that talks about it. But basically, if you look at the Buddha's teachings, actually all the teachings are about reflection. In fact, the entire Buddhist teachings is about re reflection, about how we, we reflect on, you know, on our defilements, we reflect on our life, we, re we reflect on ourselves, all right? So practically <laughs> every sutta is about that. But these three are, are interesting in a sense, like the, the first one called the Anumana Sutta, I believe uh, you, have, uh, you have the notes, right? <coughs> you have a copy of the, the suttas itself, the translated notes, right? So Anumuna, Anumana Sutta, uh, <coughs> which is in MN15, which is inference, okay? Uh, you know the meaning of inference, right? Inference is uh, like when you make conclusions that's derived from uh, reasoning or based on evidence. So we call it an inference, okay? So this sutta is about that. So we begin to look at what is it that we infer and arrive at some conclusions. But basically it's about to reflect on ourselves, reflect on our defilements, all right? And what effort can we do? And what, what kind of efforts that we can take to overcome those de de defilements? So as you, if you have been studying the teachings, you, re you realize that the Buddha not only tells us uh, what are our faults, or what are the problems that we face, but it actually offers solutions, offers the antidotes. And I think that's the, that's the key part, right? Because it's from the antidotes, from the solutions that we try to put it in our practice, okay? So that's the Anumana Sutta. So we'll spend about maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes <coughs> trying to look, look through it, yeah? And then we'll have a, well, uh, Bobby said you got a great lunch, so we have lunch. <laughs> And then after lunch, we have the Ambala Tika Rahulo Wada Sutta. It's a very long name. Basically, this is a discourse given to the Buddha's son, Rahula. And there are not only one, there are actually many suttas given to the Buddha's son. Right? So this is just one of it. And this is interesting because it also talks about our defilements and it talks more about our motivations. Okay? Because ultimately, whatever we do, whatever we say, even whatever we think, it all comes from our mind, isn't it? So our, our, our motivations are really very important. And if you remember the Dhammapada, the first verse of the Dhammapada, it says that, well, the mind is the forerunner of all things. Okay, so you've got a positive mind, you've got a wholesome mind, then things just follow, uh, you know, in, in, the same, in the same way. Yeah? So we look at the Ambalatika Rahulovada Sutta. What is it that the Buddha told his son that, that we could take back and you know, even practice in our own, uh, in our own, own, own lives. So this is uh, more on a reflection on our defilements through the mind. Of course, this sutta particularly is on, on speech, things that you say. Yeah? And the last one, which I think many of you would have heard about it, <coughs> maybe you're not familiar with the name of the sutta itself, is the Eight Worldly Conditions. Right? So the, the Pali, the, there's a sutta called the Loka Vipati Sutta. Loka, as you know, means world, right? Vipati means revolves around, it moves around. So what is it that moves around the world? So this one is, we basically reflect on our attachments. Reflect on our, on our attachments to all these eight worldly conditions. All right? and, uh, and what's the antidote? What can we do about these eight worldly conditions? Can you, can, can, can you stop the eight worldly conditions? You obviously cannot, right? It will be there. 
So the question is, what, what should we do about it? How do we live within the eight worldly conditions? All right? So if you look at the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha accepts that, well, the first noble truth talks about dukkha. All right? The second noble truth talks about what is the cause of dukkha. So Buddha gives you what is the cause of something that is not going well. And then because of his confidence, he said, yeah, but don't worry, there's an end to it. There's an end to it. There's a cessation. And he not only says, well, there's an end to it, he tells you how you go about doing it. He says, the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path. So the entire uh, spectrum of the Buddha's teachings actually revolves around these four aspects. First, understanding what is the problem, what is the issue, understanding what causes that problem, what causes that issue, and then with understanding, with right views, you're quite sure that, yeah, I, I can overcome it. All right? And then more important is not just knowing that you can overcome it, how do you do it? So, right? so that's the eight, Eightfold Path. Of course, today we're not talking about Eightfold Path. But likewise, using the Four Noble Truths as a, as a kind of a systemic structure, we, that's the way you sh we should approach uh, all aspects of the Buddha's teachings. Okay? So when we end, uh, before we end, maybe we have a workshop so that you know, you've been listening to me from, from now until maybe about 2.30, then time for you to, for you to talk. Right? But I'm not sure, do we have 24 people here? Two, four, six, two, you know, Bobby told me 30 sign up, but I, I tell you, well, people can sign up 30, 50 by the end, you know, not all will, will turn up. That's, that's, that's the norm, right? So I don't know how many, do we have 24? Two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Okay, but we'll, okay, we'll, we'll manage. Uh, Okay, so we have got wise re reflection. So I thought before we look into the, the suttas itself, let's look at this topic of wise re reflection. Since, uh, since my KRA today is to talk about wise reflection, so I better talk about what, what is wise reflection. Yeah? Otherwise, otherwise um, Bobby says in the future cannot come to BGF and speak. <laughs> okay, is it on this side? Oh, this is the one. Ah, okay. Now, two types of wise, two types of reflection. Uh, <clears throat> there are these two Pali words here, which I'm sure many of you have heard. The, the first one is called Yoniso Manasekara, wise reflection and unwise reflection. So, obviously, today we, we, we're trying to see what, are, what constitutes wise reflection. What can we do? All right. <laughs> or, or, or what is it that constitutes right, wise reflection? So in Pali, it's called Yoniso Manasekara. Then the opposite, of course, Ayoniso. So simple Pali, when you have the word A in front, it means the prefix means negative, right? Like um, Kusala means good, so Akusala means bad. Vija means knowledge, so Avija means ignorance. So the A in, in, in front uh, give it the, the negative connotation. So this word Manasekara, from this word itself, it will, it will give you an indication, give you a clue that it's got a lot to do with the mind, isn't it? So what, so what is the word that tells you about the mind? From this word, huh? Mana, right? Is it the word mana? Mana? So mana, sometimes uh, mano. From the word mana, mano, you get matnusia. <laughs> you know Malay word, matnusia? Human being? In Pali, is manusa. Right? So in, in Pali, is manusa. Now I got mixed up, which is Malay, which is Pali. So mat, m, m, Malay is matnusia, right? Matnusia. So manu, from the word manu, right? it means the mind. So here, the, the mind, that means you, sikara, from the word sika. You remember this word sika? Training, this morning you recited the five precepts, remember? What, what is the first precept? Panati, pata, veirapmatni, sika, padang, samadhyami. So sika. So that word sika means you, that means, this, that means what you have done this morning is you tell yourself that you undertake this training rule. You undertake this rule or this precept to train yourself, to train yourself, to develop your, your, yourself. So here it means you train your mind. You train your mind. Okay? So here it is you don't train your mind. Okay? All right? You allow your, your mind to, to go as, it's, as it likes. <coughs> so just a quick definition here. So it's a Pali word. You know the word Pali, right? Is the, the, which you just recited. So this includes systematic attention, careful attention, reasoned attention, thorough method in one's thought, proper consideration, wise consideration, critical reflection, 
analytical reflection, thinking in terms of causal relations. Now, the, the key, the last word here is very important because it is said that the entire <coughs> Buddhist teachings is actually based on cause and effect, causal relationship. If you are familiar with the, with the dependent origination, the, the 12 spokes of the law of dependent origination, is actually talking about causal relationships. Even the Four Noble Truths itself, you can see the Four Noble Truths in terms of a causal relationship. Can you? Can you see the Four Noble Truths? The First Noble Truth is the cause or effect. No, First Noble Truth. <laughs> Suffering, is it cause or effect? effect? It's the effect. And then the Second Noble Truth becomes the cause. Then the third noble truth is the, is the effect. The end of suffering is the effect. It's the effect of your fourth noble truth, which is the cause. Right? You see, even within the four noble truths itself, we reflect. So, for example, in, in, in a form of meditation called analytical meditation, you actually reflect on the four noble truths. <coughs> Later, I'll give you an example of analytical meditation. Right? So, the, so, the key is... Oh, sorry. So the, 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 so the key is... I think I see I've gone backward. Oop. How do I go back? I, I can't go back. Yeah? I can only go, go, go forward. Huh? No, no going backward. How, how do I go, go back? Huh? It's, a, it's a forward. Huh? Hmm? Oh, so the vision is going back, the first one, right? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So I was just saying this, this word, causal relationships. <laughs> so there's no turning back for all of you. <laughs> causal relationships, right? So it's a prerequisite for arising of wisdom. So it is said that everything that we do in, in the Buddha's practice is actually to help us to, to strive towards uh, developing wisdom, right? Okay. Right. So it's a, say it's a forerunner and, and precursor of the rising of the sun. So this is the analogy that is the dawn. So two, this is the forerunner precursor of the arising of the seven factors of enlightenment, which is wise reflection. So when one is accomplished in wise reflection, it will be expected that one will develop and cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment. So today we're not going to talk about seven factors of enlightenment, but I, I give you the name of the, the, the discourse, is the Suriyu Pama Sutta. Suriyu from the word Surya, you know the sun Surya? Right? So, this, so this discourse about, the, about you know, the wise reflection is a precursor of the rising of the sun. So it's a very interesting discourse, but we don't have time to go through all the discourses. But what I'll do in this, in, this, in this one day is try to give you as many sources as you can, as I can, so that you can go back and then, uh, because I believe you have the slides too, right? Okay, so I think the, the way you, you really learn is not so much that one day listening to me, because probably, you know, I don't know how many percent will go in. <laughs> more important is whatever materials I hope which I've left behind, that will be of, more, of greater benefit to you. So listening to, to me, some benefit, but not, not so much. Eh? But uh, if you can go back and Google and then read and then reflect on this, this, this discourse. So this is an example. This is from the uh, Samyutta Nikaya. Okay? Right. So these are the seven factors of enlightenment. So I'm not going to go, go through them. As you can see, <coughs> uh, they, are, they are all very important with mindfulness. Which, you know, these words we will come across when we talk the three discourses, right? Like, for example, the last one, the Loka Vipati Sutta, about the eight worldly conditions. So the key to practicing the eight worldly con or understanding the eight worldly conditions is, for example, the practice of equanimity, right? So each one of it actually have got its bearing on, on, on those. Okay, so now, if those, those of you who have studied Ab Abhidhamma, you, you notice that there are these mental factors, right? How many mental factors are there? Yeah. 52, right? Some say 53. So depending on which school of thought. You know? There are different schools, right? You've got the Theravada, you've got Savastivada, so different schools. But let's say 52. So this is one. So it's a mental factor that assists in the birth of wisdom and is consequently of great importance in Vipassana. So when we practice Vipassana, so the, the end result of Vipassana is of course wisdom. Okay? All right? So then you, you, you need to develop the, the, the mind. That, that is why in the practice of Vipassana, we basically hope that at the end of the day, we will see things as they really are. And, and what are these things as they really are? In the text it says, you see things as impermanent, you see things as uh, subject to change, right? They're, they're, nothing is permanent, right? Everything changes, everything moves. Even the, even the mountains, the universe, everything moves, everything changes. 
So that's the that's first characteristics of this existence. And then the second one is you see dukkha, you see suffering. All right? Suffering again doesn't mean that oh, you, 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 got, you got knocked down by a car, that's suffering. Suffering comes in so many forms, right? Mental suffering, physical suffering, and so on. And of course, all this suffering is because of that, that illusion of a self. So then the teaching of anatta, non-self. Non so when the practice of vipassana, then eventually we, we come to a conclusion that, yeah, there's this retreating. And it affects the way we, we practice. Okay? So in, it is said that in vipassana, yoniso manasikara, single important step on the path of wisdom, is thus an essential principle of dharma. So it directly precedes wisdom. So for you to develop wisdom, you need to have wise reflection. Uh, <clears throat> you may have heard that uh, there are three levels of wisdom, right? Three levels of wisdom. The first level is through listening to the Dhamma, right? Through listening to the Dhamma, through reading, right? Uh, that's why it's called Sutta Maya, Panya. Panya means wisdom, or in Sanskrit, Prashna, right? Prashna. So Panya. Of. So the first level is when you listen. Like, for example, today you, you, you listen to the Dhamma. You, you read the, the, the text, so it's called Sutta Maya Panya. So you attain one level of wisdom, all right? Good level, but not very deep, all right? So you want to extend, you want to move on to the next level of wisdom, you got to, you got to reflect, you got to think about it, you got to contemplate on it. And then you do that, then you attain to the second level of wisdom, which is called in the text as Chinta, Chinta. Chinta, not love, uh, not, not that you fell in love, <laughs> not the chinta, but well, it's, it has the same spelling, all right? So chinta maya panya, all right? So that's the second level. But ultimately, uh, the, the, the form of wisdom that the Buddha talks about is when you realize it, when you experience it. So that's where the Buddha talks about meditation, all right? We're seeing things as they really are. Because when you just think, you're just being logical, all right? But not necessarily you, you, you realize it, you see? You, there are many great logicians, right? great mathematicians, right? but they're not necessarily <laughs> they, they, they lead the, the most happy of lives. Right? So they don't really experience that. So the Buddha says the third level is when you experience bhavana, maya, panya. So the third level of wisdom. So there are three levels of wisdom. So we should not underestimate these three levels. Some people say, oh, I only need to meditate. I don't need to read the suttas, I don't need to study because that's a waste of time. You know? Time is short, life is short, so I better just meditate. If you only meditate but you don't have the, the, the second uh, aspects and the first aspects, which is to study, which is to listen, then, then that meditation may not be Buddhist meditation. It could be some form of meditation. Right? Okay? Right. So it is that way. So, so these are just explanation of what it means by wise reflection. This is a very quick uh, introduction. So it's that which paves the way for wisdom, opens up a space in which wisdom can mature. So it acts as a link between mindfulness and wisdom. If you remember the, the, seven, the seven factors of enlightenment, you start with mindfulness, right? And then you've got wisdom. So there must be a kind of a bridge, right? So this wise reflection. So it is that which guides the stream of thought in such a way that wisdom is able to get down to work and achieve results. Okay? In fact, in the, in the Mahayana, they talk about six perfections, six paramitas, right? You start with dana, and then the end is wisdom. So you, the first five, you practice the first five, and then the six culminates in wisdom. Okay? So you see, it always culminates in wisdom. Or as Nagarjuna says, you start with faith, for your practice, you start, you enter the journey using faith, but you exit the journey with wisdom. Right? So wisdom is always the end result here. I just show you a, a few secondary sources. Just now was the primary sources. Even contemporary teachers like uh, 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 Payuto, right? So he says it is that which provides wisdom, which uh, provides wisdom with his method, which is method. Uh, it is the skillful means employed in the efficacious use of wisdom, as the term is commonly used, implies both reflection and wisdom. So in other words, it's wise re re reflection. So this is from Payuto. Pa right? <clears throat> so I say that the getting rid of anxieties and trouble is possible for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see. What must one know and see in order to get rid of anxieties and troubles? What is it that you know and see? Just now, I, I give you a clue, like what is the purpose we practice Vipassana? 
it is to see things as they really are, right? to see the three characteristics of, of existence. Okay? So this is from the Sabasava Sutta, the discourse on the all. <laughs> For one who reflects unwisely their anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen, and those that have already arisen, they increase. But for one who reflects wisely, anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen do not arise. And those that already arisen, they disappear. Right? So I, I think, well, this is a long discourse, but I've just taken one, one part of this, which I think sums up the essence of that, the discourse itself. So let us reflect on, on this paragraph again. Right? So this paragraph says, for one who reflects unwisely, for one who reflects unwisely, there arise anxieties and troubles. How does one reflect unwisely? Huh? Then we come to the next three discourses. Okay? The next three discourses talk about what is wise reflection. But here from the Sabha Sava Sutta, which is the second discourse in the book of Gradual Saying, a uh, book of Middle Lang Saying, it says, for one who reflects unwisely. So, so you think, so you reflect. What, how am I re reflecting? Is it wise? Is it not, not wise? Okay. The result is, you've got anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen. And those that have already arisen, they're already in your mind, it becomes more. You get even more, more anxious, you get more problems. <laughs> so it kind of continues. Okay? But if you reflect wisely, then anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen in your mind will not arise. And those that have already arisen in your mind, you say, oh, okay, I can let it go. So it, so it goes away. <laughs> now, how do we do that? The <laughs> question is, how do we do that, right? <laughs> right? It's easier said than done, okay? How do we do, do that? So this is where uh, Buddhist techniques come in. Okay? This is where Buddhist techniques come in. It encompasses things like mindfulness. It is said that if you're mindful, then you're you are living in the present, all right? Or this way, when you listen, then maybe you listen to the Batikarata Sutta. It says, what is past is past. What is future has yet to come. What really matters is the present. So if you have been very troubled, very anxious about something that has already happened, can you do anything about it? It has already done. All you can do is the present. Make sure that you don't repeat that. Right? Or you're, you're worried, hey, you know, what will happen you know, in... Some people say, what happens if I retire? Will I have enough money? You know, will I have, uh, uh, you know, yeah, and, and all those things. So, but if you don't take care of your present now, then, then there's, not, there's nothing much you can do about the, the, the future. So you could take care of the present. So the present is very, very important. Right? So certain things, we can be concerned about it, but you can't do, do anything about it. Isn't it? Even who is this guy? Uh, Stephen Covey. You know Stephen Covey? The great uh, guru of... Uh, or seven, seven habits, right? What, did, what was his classic teaching? In, in, in life, there are areas, there are many things which are areas of concern, areas of, in, areas of influence. Yeah. You can be concerned about many things. You can be concerned about many things, but do you have an influence to change it? <laughs> if you have no influence, you, know, you, can be con you can be concerned about the trade war between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump. But is there something you can do about that? I don't think you can, much you can do about that. Isn't it? You have no influence. Right? Uh, huh? What is that? Don't buy American. Some people don't buy American, some people don't buy Chinese. Many people say, I will not buy Huawei. You know? So it's the same. You know? It's again dualistic, isn't it? All right? The fact that when we say don't buy American, that means we already have this thought that oh, the Chinese are right. But it need not necessarily be the case. Isn't it? If you speak to people... You speak to people in Hong Kong, you speak to people in Taiwan, you speak to people in Tibet, you speak to people in, in Xinjiang. Xi Jinping is a big bully. China is terrible. So it depends who you speak to, isn't it? So this world is very dualistic. Right? It's very dualistic. Okay? All right. you, you understand? So, you know. Okay, but we're not going to talk about politics. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with it. We are talking about wise reflection. <laughs> so we must not be dragged, in, in, dragged into that. <laughs> Okay, so read this discourse. It's called Sabha Sava Sutta. It's a very interesting discourse. So you, you just pick up this paragraph. Just reflect on this and tell yourself. When you've got a lot of worries, a lot of anxieties, a lot of problems in your mind, think about it. Are you reflecting wisely? Why are you having this problem? Why are you having this anxiety? Why are you having this problem? 
or it's something that's happened in the past. Can you do something about it? If you can do something about it, do it. And that's what the first discourse, Anumana Sutta, is about. Right? So, so we'll, we'll come to that. Yeah? So nature reflection, so, so again to summarize, wise reflection results in right view of the nature of existence. What is the nature of existence? Things are impermanent, things are subject to change, and things are devoid of a permanent entity called a self, an I. Right? So that's right view. Okay? And wrong view, uh, unwise reflection means results in wrong view of the nature of existence. Okay? So, this is, uh, in, in fact, I didn't mention that. There's, there's another discourse uh, which was given by Sariputta, it's, it's called the Samaditi Sutta. Uh, Samaditi. You know Samaditi? Samaditi means right view, right? Right? So you know, we know the right view as the first of the Eightfold Path, right? But there's a, that, there is a complete discourse called the Samaditi Sutta. That means a complete discourse called what is right views. Interestingly enough, that discourse was not given by the Buddha, but given by Sariputta. <laughs> so, so you see, the, but we consider it as the Buddha's word, because Sariputta is considered as the chief disciple of the Buddha. Right? So this is uh, what is right view, what is wrong views, right? it's, it's mentioned there. Okay, the final part. Uh, okay. Yep. Oh, it, oh, yeah. See, they got an expert there. They, they, they really told you MN9. Yeah. We discussed that, I think, in Sati Alam, isn't it? So we, we, we spend the whole day talking one sutta. So today we try to discuss three suttas. <laughs> so we are very, very ambitious. Right? Okay, the last part is, I'll just take about five minutes. Uh, again, we, we could spend one whole day just to discuss each of the four thoughts. Right? Now this is not, not, uh, not, not traditionally from the Theravada. This is more from the Lamrim. You know Lamrim? Lamrim is the, uh, the Tibetan, the Giluk school, right? You know, there are four schools of Tibetan Buddhism, so the, the, the particular school called the Giluk school, so it's very analytical, right? uh, founded by Lama Songkhapa. So they always talk about, before we practice the, the, the Dhamma, before we study the Dhamma, we reflect on four things. What are these four things? So I thought I'll just share this with you very quickly. Right? But there are source, sources, so you can go through the sources. Thinking about the precious human life, that's the first thought. Thinking about death and impermanence, that opportunities that we have now with this life is not going to last. All right? And thinking about karma, that is how our behavior affects what we experience. All right? And thinking about the disadvantages of samsara or of uncontrollable rebirth. Now I mentioned, you see the word here? Uncontrollable rebirth. Can we control re rebirth? Can we? Maybe we can't, but some people can, right? Those, those great meditators, uh, maybe the great, the great Achans, the great Tulkus, the, the great Lamas, so they can control the next rebirth. That is why like the Dalai Lama, he can choose where to be reborn. Isn't it? You know, you know there's a movie called The Unmistaken Child. Many years ago, we screened the, the movie. So it's a story of Lama Konchok. So when Lama Konchok, before he passed away, he made an aspiration where he wants to be reborn. And he, and he told his disciples, including Geshe, uh, Geshe Zopa, whom I think some of you know, right? So he told Geshe Zopa that, look, before I, when I die, when I'm going to be reborn, I want to be reborn, I want to make sure that I'm born in a place where I can learn English, I can speak English. Then they ask him, why? Because all the while he's been teaching Buddhism in America and he always, he always he needs a translator. He said, very messy. Next life, when I'm reborn, I want to be born in a place where I can learn English. So true enough, when Lama Konchok passed away, he was reborn and uh, Geshe Zopa and a few of the, of the Lamas, they, they found his rebirth and they, 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 they nurtured him well and they sent him to Queensland, Australia. <laughs> so that he learned English. I think now he should be what? He should be about in his teens now, I think. He's now back in Nepal. All right? So he can speak a good, good amount of English. So another five years, I think you find the young Lama, Lama Konchok giving teachings. So you should invite him then. And he'll teach in English, no more in Tibetan. <laughs> so, so great Lamas, great Tukus, uh, great masters, they, they, they want to be reborn and, and they know where to be reborn. 
I think it's not only in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, when, when the when Venerable Ying Shun, Master Ying Shun, the the master of uh, the the Sichi nun, the Chengyan, right? Chengyan. Uh, so her master, before she died, uh, before he died, a reporter asked him. He said, "Oh, master, so when you pass away, so you'll be very happy in Pure Land." <laughs> Jingdu, you know, in Amitabha, Pure Land. And Venerable Ying Shun said, no, 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 no. When I die, I'll be reborn. I'll come back to earth. Because I want to continue this, this, this task of teaching the, the Dhamma. Uh, it's those Bodhisattvas, you know, Bodhisattva concept. So if you practice the Bodhisattva uh, approach, then you make that strong aspiration. That you come back, but you can control. But I think most of us cannot. Huh? <laughs> Okay. Okay. These these are called the, the four, the four thoughts. Okay. So the precious human life. Uh, this is detailed in Shanti Deva. Shanti Deva. I'm sure you know is a very uh, uh, famous Indian master. I think in the eighth century from India, from Nalanda University. If you go to Losang Drakpa Center in Section 17, the Tibetan Center, Losang Drakpa, you will see there's a garden called the Nalanda Pandits. Uh, all the great masters, I think there's 17 of them, 17 great pandits. So Shanti Deva is, is, is one of them, right? great masters. Right? So in his uh, Bodhichaya Vatara, the way of the Bodhisattva, he says, this free and well-favored human form is difficult to obtain. Now that you have the chance to realize the full human potential, if you don't make good use of this opportunity, how could you possibly expect to have such a chance again? Right? Yeah, we are all born as humans. And we don't make use of our mind. We have a mano. So, how, so, so if we die, we may not get a chance again. All right? in, the, in the Pali text, you have two suttas uh, about the Bala Pandita Sutta. It talks about how, like a one eyed turtle in the bot- that lives at the bottom of the sea, once in a thousand years, it comes up to the top, a uh, hundred years. Okay. <laughs> we exaggerate a bit, a thousand years. A hundred years, it comes up to the top of the, 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 the water. And, on, and the water floating is a yoke. Yoke, a piece of wood with a hole there. So what is the probability, the chance of that one-eyed turtle coming up once in a hundred years, putting the, the neck into that, that, that yoke? So it's even more difficult is for, for, to be born as a human being. Okay? All right? So, so this is what Shantideva says, huh? Now I've just given you the this uh, Tibetan, so to give you some credibility. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So likewise in the Lalita Vistara Sutra, these are all Mahayana Sutra, so you won't find them in the Pali text. Right? You won't find them in the Pali text. So it says this existence of ours is as transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movement of a dance. So very flowery, yeah. So a lifetime is a like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain, the nature of impermanence. Right? So this is the way it's, it's been, been expressed. So you can, it's very flowery. Right? His Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote a book on, the, on this topic. Right? It, it, in fact, the title of the book is called uh, a, a Flash of Lightning, A Flash of Lightning in the Sky. Right? So it talks about that. So you can Google the Dalai Lama and flash of lightning. It, it actually explains about the path of the Bodhisattvas. Right? So rushing by a torrent down a steep mountain. <laughs> so in, impermanent. You see, this uh, this uh, all example. Our existence is transient. It's as impermanent as autumn clouds. Transient means impermanent. Autumn clouds. Uh, I think not, in Malaysia you don't have autumn clouds. Huh? I think every day the clouds are impermanent. <laughs> <laughs> So to watch the birth and death of beings is looking at the movement of a dance. It's like a, it's like a dance, you know. You know, there's a saying that the birth is the forward view of death. And birth is the forward view of death. In other words, when there's birth, it's a matter of time before death takes place. So birth is a forward view. What is death? Death is a backward view of birth. <laughs> so if you understand the dependent origination. So once there's death, there's rebirth. And once you're born, you, you die again. <laughs> right? So nobody can, can, can stop there. Right? Even Tom Hanks cannot. Uh, 
right? in the in the movie The Green Mile, right? Tom Hanks kind of. And after a while, Tom Hanks realized that look, it's, it, that's not not worth living forever, right? Because by the time you are 130 years old, there's nobody else that that that, that you know. Even your children have passed away. Your grandchildren have all passed away. You feel very lonely, right? Isn't it? So that's a Zen wisdom. You know, you say that when a person's, if, if, if you are having a birthday, so Zen wisdom is, you know, s- s- somebody write a calligraphy and present to the master, and, to, to the person on his birthday. And what does the calligraphy say? You know, on a birthday, it's supposed to be wishing you well, you know, and things like that. But here, this great Zen master wrote there, Grandfather dies, father dies, son dies, <laughs> and presented to, to him on his birthday. And he received it. He got a shock. What? This is my birthday. How can you say my grandfather dies, then my father dies, and then I die? Then the Zen master said, But you want me to give you blessings, right? This is blessings. You are a very wealthy man. You are a very rich man. You have so many properties. Half of Banda Utama belongs to you. <laughs> Imagine if the grandfather don't die first then the grandfather cannot pass the property to the father. If the father don't die, the father cannot pass the property to the son. So that's the sequence, that's the natural order of things. Isn't it the blessing? Right? Can you imagine if, if, uh, if, if the father is uh, 92 years old and then he realizes that all his children have died, but he's still alive? Of course, you know, he'll, he'll, feel, he'll feel terrible. And he has, if he has a lot of property, where is he going to pass his property? Who is he going to pass his property to? Right? Uh, that's when BJ will have to get in touch. Then pass the property to BJ. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so that's Lalita Vis- Vis- Vistara. Okay. So karma, the third, third thought we should reflect on is karma. Right? This is in the Raja Vavadaka you see, this is sutras, huh? you see, S-U-T-R-A, not suttas, right? So this is Sanskrit. You, you know this? It's sutra, right? So don't, don't say Raja Vavadaka Sutta. There's no such suttas, right? Because, the, the, okay. So when his time has come, even the king has to die. True? So as, as, as someone said, you know, when, when death takes place, whether you're Jeff, you, whether you're Jeff Bezos or you're uh, the... The, the, the beggar in SS2 asking for, for money, there's no difference. Right? It makes no, 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 no difference at all. And neither his friends nor his wealth can follow him. Right? Achan Brahm tells the story about the, the four wives. Right? <laughs> right? And so for us, wherever we stay, wherever we go, karma follows us like a shadow. And, in the, and today, in the last discourse in the Loka Vipati Sutta, the, the five things we are supposed to reflect on, the fifth thing is we reflect on karma. Right? So, so, you see, so you can see, even though these are from the Sanskrit sources, but you find that the Buddha's teachings are actually consistent throughout. Okay? So, and the last one is uh, because of cravings, attachments, and ignorance, men, gods, animals, hungry ghosts, and hell beings. All right? Foolishly go round, like the turning of a potter's wheel. You go round and round and round. All right? So if you look at the, I think some of you may have seen, I thought we used to have that. It's the, the, the Tibetan uh, cycle, of, the cycle of existence. Remember that? There's always a, you look, there's a picture of a man turning the potter's wheel. <laughs> it's like we are in samsara. Okay? So we go round and round. So this is called the cycle of birth and rebirth. Okay? Okay, so I've exceeded 10 minutes. <laughs> There's so many suttas. I have to be mindful of the time. All right. So, yeah, this part, no, you can ask questions. <laughs> yeah, do you have any questions on the first part? So the first part is just to give you a sort of a, you know, a appetizer, you know, to the cause. The main cause is the three suttas itself, right? So uh, the third sutta is very short but very deep and meaningful. So are there any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to add on on the importance of wise reflection? So the key is, we, the, is that we need to understand what constitutes wise re- reflection and what can we reflect on. So I've just given you one example. We reflect on the four thoughts. They are called four thoughts that turns the mind towards Dhamma. Okay? The, the one that I just mentioned is called four thoughts. And it's four things that helps turn your mind towards Dhamma. 
All right. So what are the things that turns your mind towards Dharma? So these are the four things about impermanence, oh, sorry, about precious human life, about impermanence, about uh, karma, and about you know, this cycle of birth and rebirth. So this is something we constantly we reflect on. Just one example. Of course, there are other things you can, re you can re re reflect. You see, the Buddha's teachings is very expensive. No, I don't mean expensive as in mahal. No, I mean expensive. E x p a n s i v e. Expensive. That means that there's there's a lot, very vast, right? So different aspects, right? That's why you have so many different traditions, isn't it? It is said that the, the dharma has a flavor. Has got there are forty how many forty uh, forty eight? Is it for forty eight dharma doors? Is it? Right, right. Or oh, 8,400, no, 8, 8, sorry, sorry, 84,000, 84,000 Dharma doors, yes. There are 84,000 Dharma doors, right? I don't, I, I, I wouldn't suggest you start counting now, right? But, <laughs> okay, so any question on this before we move to the first, first is it okay? So can we have, yes, please. Right, right. Sure. Well, that's why it is said that uh, the gift of truth is the highest gift. Because if a, the gift of Dhamma, actually the word is Dhamma Dana Jinati. That means the gift of truth is the highest gift. So if a person doesn't get to hear the Dhamma, so he may not know what is wise, ref, what is wise reflection or not wise re reflection. So, so that, 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 that is why the Buddha spent 45 years teaching the, the Dhamma, so that people get the opportunity. And if we have, and if in this life we get the opportunity to listen to the Dharma, so we believe that we have sowed, we have sowed some Dharma seeds in our subconscious. Next life, then when we are reborn, we will have that affinity. All right, we have the affinity. So actually, especially in the Mahayana and Tibetan tradition, they always believe in creating this affinity with whoever that they have met for the first time, so that we give them the opportunity to listen to the Dharma. So that once they have listened to the Dhamma, then hopefully they can have some wise reflection. You know? So, yeah, you, you're all right. That's what the Buddha says. Uh, you know, the first, the four thoughts, the first thought is uh, precious human life, right? In the, in the detail which I did not go through because of time, it talks about what are the blessings of a human life. And one of the blessings is to be born in a place where there is Dhamma. Yeah? Of, obviously, the, the karma has got a lot to do with it. That is why it is said we create karma, isn't it? We create positive karma so that even, if, even in this life, we can always have opportunities to meet with, the, with Dharma friends, with Dharma teachers. Right? And if in this life, we are not enlightened. That's okay, but we have enough store of merits. Next life, even you are born in... Saudi Arabia, you know, you, you, you will <laughs> probably you get an expat job, you know, and then, as if, and then you, you come to maybe, uh, you, you come get, get a job as an IT in Banda Utama, and then BJF is nearby, and then you can come. <laughs> so somehow there's this affinity, all right? Master Ying, uh, Master Singin, Master Singin, he, he wrote a book called Creating Affinity. It's a book called Creating Affinity. So you read that book, it talks about how it's important for us to create affinity with many people. So that we, we, we kind of uh, sow the seeds, you know, we sow the seeds, right, for, 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 for them. So I think it's a very good thing for us to, to do. Okay? Yes? Hmm. What's the difference reflection and how about contemplation? <laughs> well, in, in English, we use the same word, contemplation, reflection thinking, but I think may, maybe there's some slight difference in, 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 in Pali, right? So, yeah. Um, thank you, Brother. Now, just like to respond to Brother because I, I just happened to come across a very interesting sutta which talked about this Munisoma sutta. Mm. Um, Avijja sutta? Avijja sutta, yeah, okay. So I think this is kind of a very important step in Paul, and I think the before that, uh, what the brother was saying was, I think the step one is Kayanamita, right? Associating with the wise, and then you um, listening to the Dharma, the true Dharma, and then you develop the faith, and then when you have, um, you have to do this step before you go on. Sure, sure, yeah, ye
Yes, I, I totally agree with you. Spiritual friends, as you say, use the word Kalyana Mitas, Kal Kalyana Mitras, those are very important. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> of course, this is mentioned so many other places. Mangala Sutta talks about associate with the wise, not with the foolish, you know. Sigalovada Sutta, you know, talks about good friends. So sometimes when we associate with good friends, and uh, maybe at one level, even those, those good friends, even if they don't know Dhamma, but if they are friends who are steep in morality, steep in virtues, then at, then at least they will, they will not encourage you to do things which are amoral. I, I, immoral, you see. Uh, maybe once you have that, you have a taste of what importance virtue is. If in the past you have you have some affinity with the with the dharma, then that, that will create conditions for for ripening of good seeds. Yeah. So so I think those those are very important. spiritual friends are very important, right? Um, you know you know in the Tibetan tradition the, there's this word geishi, geishi. You heard of the word geishi? So sometimes some Tibetan masters, they say, oh, geishi, geishi la, you call him geishi, right? So the word geishi actually is, is a Tibetan from the Pali or Sanskrit word kayana mitra. It means a spiritual friend. Yeah, it means a spiritual friend, a geishi, right? Okay, right. So, any other questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, I think it's quite obvious that, that there is uh, unwise reflection because just as there is mindfulness, right mindfulness, also wrong mindfulness. Just as you have concentration, you have right concentration, you also got wrong concentration. All right. So, so if you have wise re reflection, then it will lead to wholesome results. If you have un unwise reflection, it will lead to unwholesome actions and unwholesome actions will have unwholesome results okay so i think that there is there is some correlation there all right but uh, there is obviously a difference between wise reflection and unwise reflection if we look at the eightfold path it, it, it itself for each of the what we call right actions right speech and right and there's a wrong part of it okay so here wrong you can say it's subjective what is right what, what is wrong right so here, then later we go into, into Buddhist uh, ethics. What is considered wrong is something uh, which, in fact, we'll discuss in this three to discuss. Something that when performed through thought, through speech or through action, it leads to, uh, it leads to afflictions for oneself, it leads to affliction for others. And it leads to affliction to oneself and others. So that is not considered a skillful action. In, in fact, uh, many translators today prefer to use the word skillful, the word kusala. Kusala means skillful. So what is skillful? To do something that will lead to uh, real happiness for oneself and others. Not just for oneself alone and not just for others, but for oneself and others. So that is defined from the, the, the Buddhist ethics as, as, a, as a virtuous action, as a wholesome action. And how can you, and you're only able to do that if you have got a wise reflection about things, if you see things as they really are. Right? But if your mind is clouded, you have wrong views, for example, right? then how? For example, if you, if you think that, oh, you know, uh, chickens are, are, are red for, for my pleasure. <laughs> you know, so, so I eat the chicken because it's for my, for my p p pleasure. Then that's, that's a wrong, wrong, wrong view, isn't it? It's a wrong, wrong view, right? It doesn't mean that you have to be a vegetarian, but it means that to have that thought. Or you say, oh, it's okay to hunt dumb animals because they are dumb. <laughs> All right? So that's from the Buddhist perspective, because it's a view that you have. It's a wrong view. Because of that wrong view, you hunt animals. So when you hunt animals, you kill them. It's an unwholesome action. It's a skillful, unskillful action. Okay? It depends on what type of meditation you, 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 you do. What is the purpose of doing meditation? All right? Meditation is just an English word. The Pali word is bhavana. Bhavana means mental cultivation. But I like the, the, the Tibetan, uh, Tibetan translation of the word bhavana. 
which is gom, G-O-M, gom. Gom means associating the mind with anything that is wholesome, positive, skillful, that leads to one's well-being and the well-being of others. That's, that's the, the, the Tibetan definition. You look at Google this word, gom, G-O-M. G-O-M. So, so that's one way of looking at meditation. Because you, you, you can say, look, I learn meditation because my motivation is I want to learn how to, uh, <laughs> how to walk through walls, how, how to levitate, you know, so that I can hear what my neighbor is talking. <laughs> Uh, or so that when I have these powers, I know what my mother-in-law is thinking. <laughs> well, you, you can de develop concentration. Yes, you can develop concentration. That's why, it's, but is that right concentration? Obviously not from the Buddhist perspective. Yes, you can have concentration. Right? There, are, there, are, there are many people who, 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 who can use the mind to, who have got psychic powers. In Pali, they're called idis. Right? Edis, right? So they, they can do many things. And how do they get those edis? Through meditation. So one has to be very careful uh, why one is doing meditation. For what purpose? For what purpose? To calm the mind, wonderful. But it's more than just to calm the mind. One does meditation so that one sees things as they really are eventually. That's why from the Buddhist perspective, meditation is ultimately is vipassana, isn't it? All right? uh, whether you... <laughs> whether you you, you have uh, samatha vipassana or your pure vipassana, I'm in no position to argue on, on which, is, <laughs> which is the one, right? Depending on your teachers, right? Some people say, oh, only pure vipassana. Some people say you must have samatha, develop concentration. But the purpose is very clear, to see things as they, as they, as they are. Yeah, but, but I think, you know, they, they are using, in America, they teach the soldiers to meditate so that their mind is very calm, they kill themselves. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, sure. So that you are more mindful how, so that the, sh the, the sharpshooter is very mindful how he, he hits the, the target and so on. Well, <laughs> that's, that's where meditation has been debased, isn't it? Right? Mindfulness meditation in, in, in America today is a big thing. Right? It's a big thing. In fact, meditation is, the, is in Vogue, as they say, Vogue, V O G U E, is in there. So everybody. I, I think uh, in the, I, I shared one, one photograph during the Meta convention when uh, last, uh, last year, last September, when I was in my office in New, in New York. As I was coming up from my office, those of you who were at the Meta convention, you remember that, that, that slide? So I was coming up, I saw a van, and I was surprised. In that van, there was a, there was a, a poster which, which says 10 US dollars for I think for one minute or five minutes of meditation. <laughs> yeah. So and and I was looking at it, and uh, then I asked myself, "Gee, I'm in a wrong occupation." <laughs> in 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 the states, you know, they charge 10, 10 US dollars for, for for five minutes of meditation. So you go inside that, that little uh, four wheel drive, you know, or, or that little vac. The van, so you, you sit there and meditate because meditation helps you to calm your mind. It distresses you, right? In the in, in the West, many years ago, there was this uh, this doctor called John Kabat-Zinn. John Kabat, I'm sure you have heard of him. So he was a doctor. He wasn't a Buddhist. He was a doctor. He was uh, attached to the medical school, University of Massachusetts, and he found that mindfulness meditation can actually help to to actually stabilize mental conditions or even cure psychosomatic illnesses. And he makes use of mindfulness meditation. Right? So John Kabat-Zinn. So people who, who, who go for his meditation, they don't have to say, Budang Saranang Gachami, Damang Saranang Gachami. No, they don't do that. Because it's secular. S-E-C-U-L-A-R, secular. So mindfulness is, or meditation in the West is secularized. Right? That's, okay. So, so many people in the West knows about meditation, but they trace it back. It's actually on Buddhism. Okay, maybe I, I should start on the on Anumana Sutta. Otherwise, we may take three days to finish this. <laughs> okay, can I have the next slide?